Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, I welcome you to this plenary event on space transportation, capabilities and future directions to enable commercial, scientific and human expansion into space. I'm also pleased to have been invited to try to moderate this session. My name is Guy Holmork. I'm from the Norwegian Space Center. We have eight panelists. I will rapidly go through the names and the, uh, where they come from. We have one hour. I, not to lose time, I will go directly into introducing our distinguished panelists. Mr. John Elborn, he's Vice President and General Manager, Space Exploration, a division of Boeing Defense, Space and Security at the uh, Boeing Company. He is responsible for the strategic direction of Boeing civil space programs and support of NASA programs such as ISS, Commercial Crew Development Program, and the Space Launch System. Lee Rosen, next, is SpaceX Vice President of Mission and Launch Operations and responsible for mission management, payload integration, launch and on-orbit operations. He was previously Director of Launch Operations at SpaceX Launch Site at Vandenberg. He's a retired Air Force Colonel with more than 27 years of industry and Air Force experience. Mr. Gail Winters, he's the Director of Launchers at the European Space Agency. He was President and CEO of Fokker Space until 2001. Since then, he has led various ESA directorates, including technical and operational support, operations and infrastructure, resources management and industrial matters, corporate reforms and ESA improvements. He's also a good colleague from many ESA board. He was in the past council chair when he was with the Ministry of Economic Affairs in the Netherlands. Next is Stefan Israel who has since April 2013 been the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Ariane Space. Stefan has had leading, different leading positions in the aerospace industries, first of all EADS Austrium, and also has a strong background as Chief of Staff in the Cabinet of the French Ministry, Minister for Industry. Yuri Makarov, is Director of Strategy Planning Department in Roscosmos. He's a Doctor of Science and responsible for formulating state space policy in the field of technical research and scientific uh, studies. He's also a retired major of the Army. Lin Chen is a principal expert in system design of China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology, CALT, and a Deputy Chief Researcher there a professor of aerospace systems engineering. He's now responsible for space transportation systems, development strategy research, and systems engineering technology research. Tsutomi Fukatsu is director for management and integration department in space technology directorate at JAXA. This directorate was established in April by combining former launch vehicle development and Earth Observation and Communication Satellite Development Offices. After working 10 years for the development program of the Japanese experimental model to the ISS, he was assigned manager for the HTV, the Japanese logistic carrier for the ISS, which has three mission successes. Then Robert, Robert Hauser is Director of Business Development at United Launch Alliances, the ULA, responsible for launch service sales of Atlas V and Delta IV to commercial, civil, and military customers. Robert began selling Atlas II three launches to the US Navy for USF follow-up program in the 90s. As you can see, we have a strong combination of agencies and industri industries representatives involved in the development and operations of space transportation systems. My, my idea here uh, this morning is that we look at the changes in the governance for uh, developing and operations of the launcher systems. Then we will take a look at uh, on the ongoing and planned development activities. Possibly we could have some 
some discussion on market perspectives. I will try to separate the topics, but I fear that they might be linked or mixed together under way, so I'll do my best. If time allows, we will also uh, open the floor for questions and ans uh, answers for, from the, the audience. So I start right away with the goal and changes, and I look to America, to, to my right. Boeing, John Elmon. How do you see the situation, the philosophy that changing from, let's call it the old regime, and today when commercial services are being used for the transport of crew and cargo to the lowered orbit? At the same time, you are also underway building SLS going a little bit beyond. John. Thanks, Gear. Um, so at Boeing, we're involved in um, several aspects of the space program, and as you mentioned, as it's migrating, we kind of are involved in both um, both pieces of that camp. We sustain the International Space Station, and so um, very aware of the outpost in low Earth orbit that needs to be serviced. We're developing uh, CST-100 Starliner, the commercial crew system, to take passengers to space station. And also, we're involved with um, Aerojet Rocketdyne and Orbital ATK in supporting NASA in developing the Space Launch System, um, SLS. So varied, um, varied launch vehicles and approaches there. I think it's important that we look at the launch capabilities that are required as a portfolio um, and use the word and instead of versus. It's important that we have um, several launch vehicles to meet different needs. Um, beyond low Earth orbit is a different kind of capability than low Earth orbit. We've been going to low Earth orbit um, with crew since John Glenn's mission over 50 years ago. That's a mission that's understood. We know the risks. We know how to do that mission. And so that kind of a mission makes sense to look at from a more commercial approach with less government involvement. When we start thinking about going beyond low Earth orbit, exploring cislunar space onto Mars, a much more complicated, different set of challenges. And in my view, those kind of um, challenges require a launch vehicle, a launch system that is um, government-led, government-developed. That's one way to compare. Another way to differentiate in the portfolio is the size of the payload. Smaller payloads require smaller launch vehicles. Uh, larger payloads require larger launch vehicles. It took 44 shuttle flights to build the space station. If we had had a vehicle like SLS, um, we possibly could have built station in four or five flights, bigger chunks integrated on the ground and assembled on orbit. As we think about going to Mars, I think that kind of on the ground integration will be important. Large volume under the shroud of an SLS is a big deal. If we had SLS and we're designing the James Webb Space Telescope to fit under the shroud, a 10 meter shroud of SLS, it would be a significantly different design, I believe, than one that was um, compacted to fit under a five meter payload on a smaller launch vehicle. Greatly reducing the complexity of the, the telescope, the cost and the risk of the program. So I guess in summary, I think there are a lot of um, different missions that need to be serviced. And so it requires a portfolio of launch vehicles to do that. And as a community, we should discuss the benefits of those launch vehicles and the need for that portfolio um, as opposed to arguing about one particular point solution being better than others. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, John. Before I turn to, to Lee Rosen, I, in about 20 years ago, we had an administrator of NASA at the meeting in Oslo, Norway, and one question we faced in mid was, because at that time we had several new companies coming up, wanted to show that they also might be able to do something besides the two big, uh, big operators in the, in the US. And we asked, uh, when will NASA buy launch services on the market from possibly one of some of them? And the answer was very clear, never. And he, there was more a laugh to that. Today, the situation is a little bit different, and that's why I called, talk to, sorry, turn to SpaceX for the same comments. Well, I couldn't agree more with uh, what uh, my distin distinguished colleague had to say. Uh, I, we think diversity uh, in the launch vehicle business is really important, uh, both uh, nationally and internationally. 
Uh, of course, uh, right now we are very focused on our return to flight mission. Um, and that's kind of the, the main area from a, a vehicle development perspective. But we do have a lot of new and exciting things coming uh, down the pike here uh, very quickly. Um, with the development of the commercial crew program, we have some major milestones that we're getting through here in the next couple of months. Um, of course, the space station resupply mission, which uh, we're working very closely with NASA on, as well as the development of our heavy uh, launch capability, which we plan to launch um, this year, or next year, I'm sorry, in 2016. So there's, um, there's a great opportunity here for the entire industry. Um, we, again, think that competition is really important, and uh, we're very excited uh, about the, the future and the opportunities that we have. Thank you, Lee. In, uh, in Europe, I think the situation is a little bit different. We have no Buy American Act. Uh, launch operators are, I would say, a little bit more dependent on the commercial market. This is a much bigger share of their uh, activity. In the past, starting in the, in the mid 70s and early 80s, there used to be a trinity. The way ESA, the Ariane Spas, and it was CNES. And they shared responsibility and the way they, they directed the various uh, programs and uh, on what, what and the needs. Lately, Airbus Safran Lanceur is uh, taking over more responsibility, more rights, but also obligations and sharing of risks to a greater extent. Great extent. So, Gail Winters, how do you see these changes? And what are your expectations now for the years to come? Yep, thank you, uh, Ger. Um, indeed, uh, with the development of our new launch system, Ariane 6, but I have to add that also the, the further development of, uh, of Vega, we also have changed uh, in a significant way the way we are managing the sector, the governance of the sector. It's a very important and, uh, and significant change. Because, as you said, in the, in the past, uh, there was uh, uh, always the responsibility of the public sector, the agencies for the launch system, for the design of the launch system. And logically, if something was wrong with the launcher during exploitation, it was always coming back to uh, <clears throat> the agency to find a solution, and more important, to fund uh, the solution. Now, with Ariane 6, we change that. Uh, we say we break this logic. Industry is responsible for the design of the launcher, has the full responsibility for that. <clears throat> and that has an enormous implication for the exploitation of the launch system as well, because industry is then also responsible for the exploitation of the launch system. It doesn't mean that uh, the agencies or the public sector is no longer uh, present in this, uh, in this uh, domain. This is very clear. We are supporting the, uh, the development of the launch system. We are trying to arrange a, a market also in Europe of institutional uh, launches that is important for the economic model of, uh, of the exploitation of the, of the launch uh, system as well. Uh, but we are at a, at a bigger distance of the details of the launch system itself. And that is important. Industry takes that responsibility. We have also asked industry to support uh, partly the development of the launch system. That's their role. And I think that for the future clarifies and makes a transparent scheme of responsibilities in, the, in this domain. That uh, is the biggest change in terms of governance that we want to put in place with the, the new Ariane 6 and Vega system. Yes, uh, thank you, Gail. Like I said in the past, uh, Ariane's past together with uh, Knesset and ESA was uh, mo uh, more visible also in the decision-making process. Uh, today, or on this pass, you are procuring the launches from, from the industry. At the same time, you are partly owned by the industry. You know the industry to a great extent tells us what they can deliver, and not only can, but also what they will deliver. At the same time, also, we see that there might be some change in ownership of Ariane Spass. Uh, the, the main player is, seems to be taking over a bigger share of your company. How do you see now your role in this kind of the, the past, the, or the actor, or the entities that was in the past triangle? Yes, um, 
Maybe before, uh, before commenting on I and space, I want to come back to what Gaëlle has said, because I think uh, what is very important is that now, uh, in the launcher business, Europe is changing. And I think this is a very good change. This is very positive. We are reacting to a landscape which is changing, and we are right to do so. IAN6 is a new launcher, a new governance, a new way to procure it with uh, this idea to have institutional uh, anchor customers. So it's not only one thing, it's three things in the same period of time. Regarding the governance, uh, it is true that now it is uh, envisaged uh, a change in the shareholding structure of IAN space. There has been a principal agreement between the French government, CNES, and Airbus Safran Launchers, uh, saying that Airbus Safran Launcher is going to buy uh, the shares of CNES. This is now under the scrutiny of the European Commission, so we will see. But what is clear uh, as well is that Ariane Space will remain a uh, dedicated uh, and, uh, and single company. Ariane Space will remain the launch service provider of uh, Ariane, Vega, and Soyuz, and Ariane Space will remain, will remain the end-to-end uh, -end interlocutor of the customer, meaning that before the signature of the contract, up to the post-launch analysis, the customer will have uh, Ariane Space as an interlocutor. I think this is important because the customer does not want to mix everything, does not want to speak to 10 uh, different entities, and it is very clear for everybody that whatever the shareholding structure of Ariane Space becomes, Ariane Space should remain the end-to-end -end interlocutor. After, for sure, we can work differently together. And we know that in preparation for Ariane 6, we have a big, uh, a big, uh, a big file uh, ahead of us, which is how we work on the basis. And this is all about the exploitation of Ariane 6. This is all about the exploitation of Vega C. How CNES, Ariane Space, industry in the future is going to work on the basis. Uh, we have had some changes in the design authority. Uh, Gaëlle has said that the design authority has been transferred to industry. There will be some changes on the basis as well, and all the partners, and including ESA for sure, must work uh, on the basis uh, because we know that the target of Ariane's exploitation are very aggressive, and on all the value chain, including the basis, we will have to work differently. In this context, as I have said, uh, the competencies of Ariane Space uh, will uh, remain strong, and uh, what we want to do to make it simple, is to have the market and the product closer. With this new uh, shareholding structure, Ariane Space will be closer to industry, industry will be closer to Ariane Space, and it means that at the end of the day, we will be more agile, uh, more in a position to react to market changes, and market and product will be closer than they were uh, in the past. Having said that, we must also take into account Vega. Vega is under a different prime, which is uh, uh, ELV, Avio, uh, and uh, we must make sure that in this new shareholding context, Vega has all the rights they need to have uh, for a successful exploitation. So uh, this is all we are working on uh, now, but I think that uh, the trend and the direction is really the right one. Thank you, Stefan. I turn to my left and uh, Ros Cosmos. In 2013, United Rocket and Space Corporation was established to better coordinate and or improve the launcher situation in, uh, in Russia. And the, since then, the launcher and engine industry has been reorganized. In July, just a few months ago, we could learn that the, the United Launch Rocket uh, Company was integrated into the new Roscosmos. Into the new Roscosmos. What can you say regarding this new situation and uh, what can we expect from these changes in the short or also maybe also longer term? Thank you. Спасибо за вопрос. Ситуация какая? Это плановая реорганизация. Действительно, в июле месяце была создана корпорация Роскосмос. На начальном этапе, а я потом тебе дам. На начальном этапе была создана 
ОРКК – это организация, которая объединила предприятия промышленного блока, в первую очередь промышленного блока. Значит, что касается создания госкорпорации «Роскосмос», то госкорпорация объединяет в себя предприятия не только промышленного блока, но и научного блока, а также обеспечивающие предприятия. И если раньше ОРКК была в составе «Роскосмоса», то на этом этапе просто потенциал ОРКК и Роскосмоса объединяются, мы реорганизуемся в госкорпорацию. Это плановые преобразования, которые никаким образом не влияют на наши планы. Uh, because firstly, we have uh, organized uh, this joint, uh, joint corporation, uh, Rocket and Space Corporation, uh, which uh, englobed uh, only uh, industrial entities. Now uh, we, have, we are creating a new state corporation, uh, which will uh, include also scientific uh, entities and uh, supporting entities, ground infrastructure entities. And uh, though previously uh, this uh, United uh, Space and Rocket Corporation was outside of Roscosmos, both of them, um, uh, this uh, ORKK structure and uh, all the Roscosmos will be inside the new Roscosmos, the state corporation. So, uh, as uh, this is a planned motion, it will not uh, uh, have any effect on our current programs. But could I maybe add, is it's, it's a plan about what, at what time do you expect to have this in, uh, in place, this reorganization? Can you say anything about that? Это конец этого года. Ну и там будут еще некоторые процедуры, связанные с ликвидацией агентства. Это начало следующего года. А так с 2016 года сначала начинает функционировать госкорпорация Роскосмос. Uh, basically, it's uh, the end of this year, but uh, we will have also some legal procedures uh, linked uh, to the uh, dissipation, uh, formal dissipation of the Federal Space Agency and transfer of uh, uh, her assets to the new Roscosmos uh, in the beginning next year. So basically, in the first half of uh, 2016, everything will be uh, on place. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I turn then to China and to, to CALT. I'm not so sure that the development of the changes or the, the organization are being that much changed in China, but I'm quite impressed you have speeded up your, your tempo, so to say, with, with launches over the last uh, 30 days. You have launched six times. Two of them I was new versions of, or new, new launches or new versions of already existing uh, launches. What are you doing internally to speed this up? Do you make any changes in the way you are, you are organizing your industry and your actors in this respect? Thank you. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, some development about China's long launch vehicle. Uh, just now, you mentioned uh, we have successfully launched uh, six times just in recent months. So uh, I can tell you another uh, figure. Uh, between 2011 to 2015, uh, we have scheduled 100 launches. And between 2016 uh, and 2020, we have scheduled another 100 launches. So that is a great challenge to us, uh, especially to China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology. We face intensified space mission requirements. So uh, how can we uh, meet the requirements? It's a problem, yeah. Uh, in China, uh, something is changing now. Uh, during the past 50 years, we have developed uh, dozens of uh, large launch vehicles, and uh, these vehicles uh, provide solid support to China's space plan. Uh, but you know, we are facing uh, more and more uh, challenge 
in recent years, especially in the 21st century. So uh, we are uh, developing our new generation launchers, such as uh, Lambda 5, Lambda 7, and just now you mentioned uh, Lambda 6, Lambda 11. Uh, for all our launchers, uh, I think large launch vehicles are very competitive in commercial launching market with its low cost and uh, high reliability. Uh, since 1990s, uh, we have entered uh, the international commercial launching market uh, with our large 3 series rocket, and uh, we have signed many contracts with our foreign customers. But uh, the international commercial market is very complicated to China. Uh, that does not uh, uh, decided by our service. Uh, yesterday, the head of space agencies had talked about uh, some uh, factors, uh, you know, I think. Uh, but uh, we are doing our own job to improve our launch vehicle's performance and uh, to increase its uh, competitiveness uh, with its low cost and high reliability. Uh, and uh, domestically, uh, Chinese government is also encouraging uh, private sectors to invest in aerospace industry. Uh, just in last month, uh, I have met with several enterprises from private sectors to talk about uh, uh, launching their small payloads. And uh, many investors are interested in investing uh, launching market. And uh, I think all these things uh, has happened. So uh, something is changing in China now. Uh, this is a good thing uh, for us. I think uh, we lack uh, competition. The competition will promote our development in the future. So that's my personal point of view of these issues. Thank, thank you, Lin. To, to, to Jackson now, you are, as I also mentioned briefly earlier, doing some reorganizing uh, internally. I know that Japan is eager to play a more active role in the commercial market for uh, satellite launches. What are the changes as you see them from, from your perspective, both within JAXA and with, the, with relation to your, your industry and these activities? Okay, um, we are going to uh, have a new launches. So uh, that is aimed to the uh, uh, targeting uh, commercial aspects. So uh, let me explain about uh, what kind of, uh, what JAXA is going to develop the new launches. Um, it is my pleasure to introducing the uh, uh, JAXA's new launch vehicle for this uh, section. And uh, um, JAXA uh, has started the, uh, our new mainstay HC vehicle uh, development last year, uh, 2014. And uh, MHI, Mitsubishi Heavy Industry, is a prime contractor. And uh, MHI also is a, a launch service uh, for H3. And uh, H3, uh, the target year of the launch is uh, 2020. And, uh, uh, the new launchers, vehicle H3, is strongly aiming for meeting the uh, voice of customers, especially commercial. So please see the chat. <laughs> and uh, that provides a world top launch vehicle in terms of cost, reliability, and flexibility for uh, customers. So uh, let me explain about the background, why we have to update the uh, uh, developing a new launch vehicle. Uh, Japan has the, uh, uh, currently uh, three uh, launch vehicles. Uh, for uh, uh, five or uh, 600 kilogram satellites, we, pr we prepare the Epsilon rocket. And uh, H2A is a mainstay rocket now, a launch, mainstay launch vehicle now. And also we have uh, uh, H2B. H2B is the uh, uh, mainly launching uh, HTV, which is a uh, uh, logistic carrier to ISS. 
and uh, um, it's A and B features high reliability up to 97% uh, of success rate, which is one of the most reliable launch vehicles in the world. Then, uh, the first commercial private satellite by HSA is planning to launch next month, November 24th. Um, in order to maintain our high reliability and leaping technology, we need to take another step corresponding to various satellite missions, including commercial. Since our mainstay HSA launch vehicle might be insufficient to meet the future demands, the launch capability needs to be further boosted and to fit the customer's request. <clears throat> then, H3 has a target launch capability of carrying the uh, more than four tons into SSO. The, that chart shows in the uh, left side is uh, H2A and H2B, and right side is H3. H3 has uh, three types of the launch vehicles. And uh, uh, in case of the SSO, uh, by single core at half of the launch cost, it's A. And uh, uh, more than 65 tons into geostationary transfer orbit at delta velocity uh, since about 1,500 meters per sec by four equipped booster series. And to adapt flexibility to satellite with various masses and orbits, the launch capability would be adjustable by changing the uh, uh, number of the solid bo rocket boosters. And although the competition in the launch market is growing the commercial satellite, um, I think uh, it is necessary to have a multiple worldwide opportunities of the customers to choose which launch vehicle best matches their demands. And uh, I believe H3 would be one of the most competitive launch vehicles by its advantages. And, and H3 will be the basis for Japan's space activities after 2020s. Uh, you know, 2020 is the most important year for Japan because we have a Tokyo Olympic in 2020. So very, very important years. And uh, uh, we will work uh, very hard to add it. Thanks. Thank you, Fukatsu. I turn to my far left, Robert. You are operating the, the Atlas V and the Delta IV. You have, at least what we understand from the media, you are collaborating with the Blue Origin for a new engine for the Vulcan uh, rocket. You have a uh, Aerojet rocket down as a backup. At the same time, we read about the, the latter bidding for your company. I think that the situation, or got an understanding that the real situation is much more stable. So maybe you can maybe elaborate a little bit about, about where you are and how you go forward from here. Uh, yes, thank you, Geyer. Um, it's certainly a dynamic time in the launch vehicle industry. We have the H3 coming online, Ariane 6, Falcon Heavy, SLS. Um, we have uh, Angara coming on about 2020, and of course we have our Vehicle 2, and that's the, the Vulcan. Um, right now we, of course, uh, offer Atlas commercially through Lockheed Martin Commercial Launch Services, and then of course directly to the government through United Launch Alliance, and we also offer the Delta IV uh, to the U.S. government. Uh, our plans is to bring on uh, the Vulcan in the 2019 timeframe. Uh, we have struck several strategic partnerships um, with suppliers. The one that you mentioned, of course, Blue Origin, is developing our BE-4 engine, which will be the new engine for the Vulcan. Uh, we are also carrying the Aerojet uh, AR-1, Aerojet Rocketdyne AR-1, as a backup for that. Uh, the reason that we're with uh, Blue Origin, the BE-4, is right now we believe they have about a 16-month lead in terms of developing their engine. Um, they are actually conducting staged combustion uh, tests down at their test facilities. They've completed more than 60 staged combustion tests uh, to date. Um, that engine will be ready in the 2018 time frame to be qualified for launch, and then the first launch plan for fourth quarter uh, 2019. 
I, I do want to clarify that we will continue to offer the Delta IV as long as the U.S. government has national security needs for that. We will offer the Delta IV Heavy through at least mid-2020 uh, to 2020 time frame, probably to 2024, 2025. So in the 2019, 2020 time frame, we'll begin to phase out Atlas and, and go to Vulcan, but we will continue to offer the Delta IV Heavy so long as national security space requires that. In addition to our uh, partnership with BE4, we announced a strategic apart partnership with RUAG uh, Aerospace. They will supply our large, large uh, composites and our payload fairing for our next generation launch vehicles, as well as um, Orbital ATK has been selected to supply the solid rocket boosters for the flyout of Atlas. They'll begin supplying that, that version of the motor uh, in 2018. They'll also supply the solid rocket motors for Vulcan in 2019. Those are two different engines, but a, a lot of similarities in design and development such that uh, we can leverage cost savings through that. Uh, many of my colleagues have emphasized the need for competition. That's the, uh, the uh, number one dynamic in the national security space. Uh, we certainly uh, welcome uh, competition. We think that's going to be very good for the, the government. It's going to help transform ULA, and it's, it's going to be good for our U.S. taxpayers as well. Uh, in the commercial market, we certainly will be re-entering that market more vigorously um, because we need that launch rate to support uh, our total operations. Thank you, Robert. I, to Roscosmos, you are introducing a new family of launchers with the Angara program. How do you see these being uh, introduced and overlapping with the present launchers, the launch you have of today, mainly on, on uh, Proton and Soyuz? Ракетоносители Протон это закрывают класс тяжелый, то есть это ракетоносители тяжелого класса, поэтому те испытания, которые прошли в прошлом году и в этом году, Ангары, это ракетоноситель, который со временем придет на смену Протона и закроет тоже нишу тяжелого класса, то есть это порядка там 23 тонн на опорную орбиту, и какое-то время эти два носителя будут существовать вместе. То есть планируется осуществлять запуски тяжелых ракет «Протон» с Байконура и э, тяжелых ракет-носителей «Ангара» э, в модификации «А-5» э, с «Восточного». Э, а со временем «Ангара» заменит «Протон», так как это носитель, который использует экологические чистые компоненты топлива. Well, we have uh, started uh, to use the Ankara launch vehicle with the test uh, launches last year and uh, this year. And um, with Proton, uh, we know that it's a heavy launch vehicle. It uh, covers uh, this range of payloads. And uh, with Angara uh, aiming for the same uh, segment of payloads, around 23 tons to the low Earth orbit. Uh, they will coexist for some time, uh, but uh, eventually uh, Proton will be phased out and replaced by Angara uh, in its A5 modification, which will be launched uh, from Vostochny Cosmodrome instead of uh, Baikonur for Proton. Uh, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Your Europe, when I going to say Europe, but turn to both ESA as well as Ariane Space. You have been uh, having quite a strong focus on Ariane 6 of the last year. You have changed the design underway, and uh, still I think you need for the, the ESA member states to take a final go based on the intermediate review next year. And I think that all focus is on this activity. Are there still any? other new active or activities turn towards next what will follow after uh, Ariane 6 on new systems new technology or are all the focus on the on, on the, the present version and let me see where we can go from that well Ariane 6 is certainly dominating a little bit our world at the moment this is very clear it's a very important uh, development and uh, 
as was said many times, the calendar is very uh, stringent. We have to have a launcher available in 2020 uh, with these characteristics. But of course, it would be a bit stupid not to think about the longer term future. And uh, we are doing that in, uh, in Europe as well. We have two programs uh, in, uh, in ESA supported by our member states, uh, a long term technology program for launchers. And we are also starting a new program, which we call the Launcher Evolution uh, Program where we think about two main themes. One is, what can we do to have a significant decrease of the cost of the engine of a launcher? I mean, the engine is the important part in terms of cost, and we want to have a, another step function in reducing the cost of the engine. Second theme, and not disconnected from that, is what can we do in the future with reusability of engines? Reusability is a, is a big theme. Uh, okay, technically, we still have to see if it works, but certainly in the economic sense, it's a, it's a very difficult issue because you need, in our view, big numbers to make the economic model of reusability. Doesn't prevent us from starting to think how to use that. You know that in our European industry, there's a lot of thinking ongoing on that, on that issue. We will support that and we will work <clears throat> together with industry to develop new concepts also for reusability. So we start that. Of course, it's a longer term future. First, we have to build Ariane 6. <clears throat> From a market standpoint, um, I would like maybe to add something. Uh, I fully agree with Gaëlle. I mean, the top priority is Vega C and Ariane 6. And nothing should uh, make us deviate from that. Uh, and uh, what we are speaking here when we evoke the long term, it's really beyond Vega C and Ariane 6. Uh, I think the evolution described by uh, Gaëlle are the right one, uh, engines for sure, uh, to see whether something is feasible or not on reusability. What I want to say from a market standpoint is that I am uh, impressed by the tendency to go for satellites between uh, 50 kilograms to 300 kilograms, uh, be it on Earth observation or uh, maybe also uh, for broadband, broadband and uh, telco. And I think here we must, uh, on the long term, we must, uh, ref we must better understand what is the best uh, proposal, what is the best launch service solution for this kind of satellites. If really this market materializes in the next decade, uh, we will have uh, to take that into account. Uh, we have our family, we will have Ariane 6, we will have Vega C, and Vega will be perfectly adapted for uh, constellations, but maybe, maybe, uh, we will need a dedicated uh, micro-launcher. I say maybe, it's not a proposition, it's not a program, but it is an idea, and what I want to say here, we must open the door of innovation. Innovation will not only be about reusability and so on, innovation will be broader than that. Innovation can be funded by the private sector, if there is a market. So uh, if there is a market, it will be the private sector to fully react to the demand. Uh, and so in this uh, innovation package, we should also take into account this tendency of the market to go for satellites between 50 to 300 kilos. I do not know what is the right answer, but I see that something is uh, emerging there. And for the next decade, we can think about that. Yes, I was ab about to give you the floor because uh, talking about innovation and talking about reusability, difficult to, to not to mention what's happening in uh, in SpaceX. And I must admit, I was had my uh, eyes glued to, to my computer when you tried to to land the the first states. So you are probably no, prepared I, to that, excellent points on reusability. And uh, reusability is not an if; it is a when. Um, we have landed a rocket on the drone ship um, for a short period of time, and then uh, we, we, will, we will land a rocket on a drone ship, and we will also land the rocket on land uh, in the coming months here. So we're very excited about this opportunity. We're working very closely with the Air Force uh, and the ranges to ensure a publicly safe uh, landing of vehicles back on land, and we're about to do that here in the coming months. Uh, the drone ships are ready on both coasts uh, to support landing, so all of our future vehicles will include reusability. I, I personally can't think of another mode of transportation that you throw away after using it one time. Uh, imagine how much it would cost to fly to Israel if you flew away, threw away 
away that airplane that, uh, that you flew here on, right? So we believe that reusability uh, is, is a big part of the future and aircraft-like operations are, are very much a part of the future uh, to bring low cost and reliability. Someday, folks are gonna come to say, hey, I wanna fly on that rocket that has flown before because that is a proven capability, right? So uh, we like to use the term certified pre-flown uh, as, uh, as, as what, what we'll be able to use for the reusable vehicles of the future. I, I remember some years back, if you go back to late 80s and also in the 90s, I remember the IEF congresses, that was a place to, where you got the papers on Hotel, on Sanger too, we had presentations on NASP, uh, Scramiet, all kind of technology, everything technology. But, but it, it's been calm for some years until you started this test, but I think all companies, all uh, operators have that in mind. So are there any other comments from uh, on the same topic, so please free. Yeah, I'll start, I'll start with uh, you, Robert. Uh, yes, thanks, Geyer. Um, absolutely agree with Lee and, and Stefan's comments on reusability. I do believe, and, and we at ULA believe, it's not an if, it is a when. Uh, our approach to reusability is not going to start with total vehicle or total stage reusability. We're going to start on modular reusability. Uh, we've coined a phrase, smart reuse. Smart means sensible, modular, autonomous return technology. So we're going to start, as Stefan mentioned, with the high cost, high value components of the rocket. We're really focusing in on, on the first step uh, to recover the BE-4 engines. And the way that we'll do this is, first of all, uh, as the vehicle's flying hypersonically, we will deploy a heat shield, an inflatable heat shield, to protect the engine in, from the, the heat of the return. Uh, it'll slow it down. We'll have some drone chutes, uh, which will slow it further. Finally, a parafoil, which is an extremely well-developed technology, uh, will deploy. And that's steerable, and we can fly this back with a parafoil, not all the way back to the launch site. Um, but then recapture with uh, an aircraft, most likely a helicopter. This has been demonstrated since the 1960s, um, you know, with the return of, of photographs from space. Um, and it's actually been demonstrated in terms of uh, recovering mass up to 40,000 pounds, uh, which is about 18, 19 kilos. Uh, uh, but but uh, anyway, in, in that range. So we think that this is uh, very... Uh, sensible way to approach and then further on downstream I think uh, we'll continue to develop and, and expand that reusable technology to go to the full stage or vehicle level. Thank you Robert. Lin. Thank you Gail. Uh, I think reusability is a long-term goal we would pursue. Uh, China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology is also interested in developing reusable launch vehicles uh, we have developed uh, some advanced uh, reusable launch vehicle technologies, such as uh, uh, advanced uh, thermal protection systems, re-entry control technology, uh, hypersonic aerodynamics research, and uh, RBCC technology. Uh, but uh, I want to mention another key issue besides the technical uh, issues. That is, uh, how much would we pay for the reusability. I don't have any doubt that SpaceX will succeed in vertical landing, but uh, how much will SpaceX pay for that stage's reusability? I think that's a key issue, yeah. Thank you. Yuri. Ну, многоразовость это является одним из способов снижения удельной стоимости выведения полезного груза, это понятно. И в нашей стране Роскосмос проводит также исследования в части многоразовости. Но э, вопрос в том, насколько это экономически целесообразно сейчас. Э, в любом случае это дает э, толчок для развития технологий. Как только пройдет некая точка безубыточности, когда это будет с прагматичной точки зрения целесообразно использовать, это будет использоваться. А пока мы формируем определенный задел в части многоразового использования элементов ракет-носителя, у нас были там соответствующие э, взаимные исследования с европейским агентством, 
И в настоящее время мы продолжаем эти исследования и в любом случае считаем, что тоже это в принципе перспектива, но однозначно толчок для развития технологий эти исследования дают. Uh, well, uh, initially I can say that uh, uh, the reusability uh, um, gives us a uh, better uh, price aspect for the payload. But uh, with uh, current technology, uh, with current technologies, uh, main issue is the cost of uh, this reusability. Uh, we, uh, currently, it's uh, uh, not, not rentable to do so and uh, but anyway we in Roscosmos we do researches technological researches and we believe that uh, in some future uh, these technological uh, this technological research which itself uh, gives us uh, new ideas new materials it will lead us uh, to the rentability point uh, from which we will be able to say about uh, the practical use of reusability. We do uh, these studies uh, by ourselves and with our European partners uh, too, uh, and we hope that in uh, some future uh, they will uh, do a basis for the use of uh, commercially viable reusable systems. Thank you, Yuri. John. Uh, yeah, just a couple thoughts. I think it's been um, apparent for a long time that um, the holy grail of getting launch costs lower is reusability, and even better if it's single stage to orbit um, reusability. Back in the mid 80s, there was a DARPA program that um, resulted in a um, vehicle called DCX that McDonnell Douglas built. It was vertical takeoff and landing and, and um, was destined to be a short. Um, single stage to orbit. The only reusable vehicle that we've actually operated is the space shuttle. It turned out to be a lot more expensive to turn it around in between flights and to refurbish than the original studies predicted. And so it was not as cost effective as we might imagine. It's also dependent on flight rate. The solid rocket boosters, for example, that were part of shuttle were recovered and refurbished during the shuttle flights, but for the um, envisioned low flight rate of SLS, it doesn't make sense to maintain the infrastructure and the recovery ships, etc., to recover and refurbish. So I think it's important as we look at reusability to focus on the turnaround costs, the total operational scenario, and the total cost of the system. And, um, but first you got to recover it, I suppose, to, to start working on it. But I, I hope that those working on reusability really focus on the, uh, the total turnaround. I think that, I think that is obvious. And, uh, some of you have already touched upon that. And last uh, topic, you started, Stefan, on, on the market and also maybe the micro launch or smaller uh, or adapting to smaller payloads. But what is, as you see it, the biggest change we could expect on the market? Is it, is it all the constellations? What I'm trying to find, to get your comments on if you have any. What, where do you see the biggest changes in both ways, ups and downs? Who takes start? Stefan? Um, just coming back to reusability, I think we have two questions. Will it work and what will be the good concept? I think these two questions remain open today. Uh, coming back to the market, uh, I, I would like to say uh, the way I would take the things would be the following. Today, uh, the satellites we launch with Ariane, the driver is uh, broadcast. Uh, well, I, I refer here to the open uh, commercial market. I think the big question is, tomorrow, will the driver be broadband? Will we have a shift from broadcast to broadband? If it is the case, uh, what will be the relevant answer? which orbit will be the best one to fulfill new broadband needs? Will it be LEO? Will it be MEO? Will it be GTO or GEO? Uh, you know that there is a debate among the space community. As a launch service provider, uh, I, I want to say that we are interested by all orbits. Uh, we see that our core customers are going to these three different directions. We have one big operator which has just made an announcement with uh, Facebook and uh, Amos, which uh, bets more on Geo. 
We have uh, SES, which bets more on uh, Mio, and we have uh, newcomers such, such as OneWeb, maybe uh, SpaceX tomorrow, regarding satellite, which uh, more bet on Leo. But I think uh, the way we should take the question is the uh, following, is are we going to shift from broadcast to broadband, and then what would be the relevant uh, answer? Uh, we could have a mix. Uh, Intelsat uh, has made a sort of synthesis. They have a big uh, geo satellites and they want to have interoperability with Leo. I think it's very interesting. Um, I think we, we must take seriously uh, this demand for hyper connectivity, for new connectivity. And uh, I really hope that space uh, will be able, from an economic standpoint, with new answers, new technological answers. To, to fulfill this new demand. Okay, thank you. Are there others that want to comment on the same? Yes, Robert. Uh, yes, and so um, I think we also are looking at the different uh, final destinations of the satellite orbits, whether broadcast or broadband to the LEO, uh, MEO, or GEO. In addition to that we're, to that, we're having a lot of different conversations also with the traditional geostationary com communication um, providers in terms of to what extent will electric buses proliferate that commercial bus market and what would be the final destination transfer orbit that they would like to, be, like to go to even though their final destination will be geo. So one of the things that we're doing in terms of turning the uh, tuning the performance of our future Vulcan rocket is to get a better prescription on what the orbital requirements will be um, for the commercial space as well as our U.S. government customers. Thank you. We have two minutes for any question that might be from the audience. It's difficult for me to see. I see a lot of hands. Of, of course, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I come from China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. Uh, we've talked a lot about the reusable uh, technology. Uh, this is very critical and very important for the future development of our space field. Uh, I have a suggestion for SpaceX. Uh, I have talked this with Mr. Barry Masamori before, also Vice President of SpaceX, that uh, if you can launch your uh, launch vehicle from the west coast of Australia, uh, you will have the possibility to recover your first stage uh, on land. That will be very easy because, you see, although you can also uh, uh, recover on land, but if you launch with a very low uh, inclination, you will have no choice when you launch from the uh, east coast of the United States. So do you think it is a good idea to uh, we set up a launch site on the uh, west coast of Australia? Uh, I've discussed this with some of my Australian friends, uh, such as uh, Mr. Brett. Thank you. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, we, we have not thought about uh, alternative launch sites other than the ones that we have uh, in the United States. Uh, we have launched from other uh, places as well. Uh, obviously, SpaceX had a launch site uh, in Kwajalein, so uh, I guess nothing is out of the question when it comes uh, to things like that. One of the things we have um, considered and, and thought about a little bit uh, as an opportunity for, for launches like that uh, out of Brownsville, Texas, right? So we are building a launch site in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, very, very uh, southern launch site there, and um, the opportunity to potentially look at recovering vehicles uh, in Florida. So a very similar concept to what you might do um, launching from, say, Western Australia to, uh, to the coast of California. So those kind of concepts are, are something that we are looking at and, and considering very seriously. So that's a great question. Um, no, nothing against my Australian friends. I'm sure, uh, you know, we would... We would uh, Love to, love to talk to them too, so thank you. I saw you, Peter, the selling. You had your hands up quite uh, early. It's a very short question, very unromantic. So first for ULA. Uh, the US government doesn't like the Atlas use of Russian engines. My question to you is this. If you ran out of uh, the engines that you can buy now for the US government, couldn't you continue buying engines for your commercial Atlas launches? 
and then some of the engines you've provisioned for that vehicle move those over for government launches? And for SpaceX, the most obvious question in the room having nothing to do with long-term future is when are you going to be back into flight? What, could you give us an update on where you are in return to flight for the F9 upgrade? In terms of the RD-180s, uh, absolutely correct. We have no pr uh, restrictions in terms of using the RD-180 for civil or uh, commercial launches. Uh, I really can't speak to whether or not it would be permissible um, from the U.S. government's uh, uh, perspective if we would buy more engines and then uh, transfer. So um, I think it's an excellent idea. I think we should explore it. <laughs> Yeah, Peter, and as far as uh, the return to flight goes, uh, we are wrapping up our investigation. Uh, we've had great participation from a number of different agencies, uh, from NASA to the Air Force to the FAA uh, and, and several others that uh, are also taking independent looks at uh, what we're doing. So uh, we're getting uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of help on the investigation, which has been, been super. Um, the return to flight, uh, we believe in the next six to eight weeks we will be able to return to flight and uh, things are coming along nicely with uh, the upgraded version of the vehicle and um, we're, we're prepared to get back at this. Okay, with this, I, th sorry, I think we have to close uh, this morning's session. I thank you all for listening in and to take part in this event. Also thanks to the panel for their contributions. Have a nice day. <laughs>